So I will give you, I mean, we are here all detecting particles, right? So your story about particles. Uh, so I will give you, just guide you how to hunt for them. Okay, that is my question here. And mostly, since you are all engineering students here mostly, this is even better because you, we need a lot of engineers to hunt them, to develop the tools that we need to detect those particles. So let me just see. So a particle physicist, what is the job of a particle physicist? There are mostly two kinds, actually. So what we want to know is basically what are the elementary constituents of matter? How everything is made out of? What it is? Okay? What are the bricks and mortars that the universe is made out of? And then all these particles, they combine together that you all know. They make nucleus, they make atoms, they make molecules, and a complicated object like us. And how do they interact with each other? And so how, what controls their behavior at the most basic level? So these are the two basic questions particle physicists ask and try to find answer. So I'm basically in the first part of my talk, I'll try to motivate you why you are doing this, and then come back and see what are the tools that we need. OK. So let me look into the history of search of particles. OK. And it is that started not today. OK. Many, many years back. And even in Indian, you know, you know, in the ancient India, we used to knew that the whole world is made out of five things. This is all new. I mean, if you ask anybody, you will say that we knew. I mean, why you are doing all these experiments? It's five things, right? Earth, air, fire, water, and sky. These are everything is made out of. So that was our ancient belief, and that's what we started. Of course, over the years, people go on asking the same question again and again. And with the new development of new knowledge, new technology, and so on, they are changing their, their interpretation of what everything is made out of. So by 1900, roughly, we knew that the whole universe is made out of some 100 things. These are the elements, right? From hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, all these elements. And this is Dalton's theory that everything is made out of its own atoms. Okay? And that's it. So that and atoms, there was some idea of atom structure and so on. But again, tools were developed and these ideas started changing. By 1936, we are back to from these hundred elements to again three elements. Okay? This is the what Rajaji has earlier talked about, proton, neutron, and electron. So everything is made by 1936. We knew that everything is made out of proton, neutron, and electron. Neutron was just discovered by that time. And then we have these three particles. And look at that. Neutrons and protons make the nucleus. Electrons go around that, make atom. OK? And that's it. And more protons and neutrons you, you load into your nucleus, you will get different elements. And that's me. So this is, again, nice idea. So world has become, again, very simple. Life is simple for us. We only have to study three particles. But then what happened? Around that time, a new set of tools came into existence. And these are the particle accelerator. And soon, this particle accelerator started bombarding and looking inside the nucleus. What is there inside? And they started seeing a variety of new particles, a large number of them. And their number, so now again, by 1960s, we are again back to a large number of particles what we have in 1900, okay, when we have the 100 elements. We have started discovering a new particles almost every third day. And their numbers, I have just listed some of them, what are the particles who are there. And the number became so large, even we didn't know how to classify them. So we classify them according to their mass, according to their properties, and so on. For example, we had these particles, what you call these mesons, they are this the pi zero is one of the lightest of them, and then it goes on pi zero, k particle, eta particles, and so on. And their masses were basically, these particles that time were thought to be lower than the mass of the proton. Okay? That's why they are called mesons, the lower mass particles. But then protons was roughly around 1 GeV, its mass. Okay? You have studied it, one 938 MeV you have studied, but roughly 1 GeV. OK, 1,000 MeV is 1 GeV. So take it 1 GeV. But then they started number of them. And these are their masses. You see, they're increasing. And there are some particles, electron to begin with, which is has a very little mass, 0.5 MeV. And then as Rajaji has talked about that, then soon a new particle, just like an electron, has discovered 
in cosmic ray and it has mass of something like 200 times than the mass of the electrons. Okay? And then something else also. So, so then you see, again, large number of particles came into existence. So how to explain them? Now, this idea is that, are they all elementary? You know, it is very difficult. Scientists want to see things simple. So they are not happy with the large number of particles. So started looking them, put them into different categories and see their properties and so on. And then ultimately, around that time, came this idea of eightfold wave. They put them, I'm not going to go into theory of them, just to basic ideas. You put them into some categories, okay? All those, all those lighter particles that I call the mesons, you put them, and all those heavier particles that I call baryons earlier, which is proton and heavier, you put them into another category. And prove them according to the, their properties. The properties are defined by their quantum numbers. Like electron has a quantum number called charge, right? They have a spin. They have other quantum number. One of the quantum number they have that time is called strangeness. And other one is charge. Here is the strangeness and charge. If you plot them, they just peculiarly fit into a nice eightfold way. Okay? This is, the, you plot them as a function of their strangeness. This particle has here also strangeness 1, 0, minus 1. And these are their charges okay, along this line. Okay? So there is minus 1, 0, plus 1. Minus 1, 0, plus 1. So this is, the idea came, and Maury Gellman, and from there, and, and Nguyen, they, they actually grouped them into this group, and then this is called Eightfold Wave. And this can be easily explained later on when Gellman gave us this idea and uh, Zoid that this may be all those particles are even smaller constituents made out of. For example, they needed only three such constituents. Okay? It's called up, down, and strange. And they are antiparticles. Okay? So this actually, again, in the same, I am just plotting them as a quantum number, strangeness and charge. Strangeness and charge. And then you put them, and then you combine that particles, and you'll get your all particles here. The same eightfold way. But now you say this particle K meson is not a fundamental particle, but it is a made out of one quark and a antiquark. This is also a quark and antiquark. Those that time only three quarks were there, U, D, and S. So, and they are antiparticles. And this other heavier particle that we talked about, the baryon octet, they are made out of three quarks, each of them, okay? A different combination of three quarks. And this can be explained. Of course, this was an idea, theoretical idea at that time to explain. Again, like theorists were always polite that they will say these are all the theoretical ideas, but soon, we started getting evidence in experiment, again in accelerator, that such constituent inside protons exist. And then the idea of quark came into reality. So now, for example, according to these models, and uh, later on we know that the proton is made out of two up quark and one down quark. A neutron is made out of two down quark and an up quark. And then the, the, the protons and neutrons make the nucleus and then the electron going around that. So now, with this complete picture, what is our picture today? So at present, only again a few particles we need. Rajaji has already given you this, this pictorial, the, 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 this uh, table, but I'm just putting it again. So what everything is made out of. So we need the quarks, and six of, the, actually that time, started with three of them, but now we have discovered three more, so there are total, Six quarks, okay? Up, down, strange, and strange and charge, top and bottom. And similarly, three left, six leptons. The electron, muon, and tau meson, and each of them is associated with an electron, neutrino. So for example, electron has its own neutrino, muon has its own neutrino, tau has its own neutrino. And these three neutrinos are again different. They're not the same neutrino particle. They're different, okay? They're <clears throat> and then these are the, what you call the matter particle. But then I have told you that our job is two things. One is to explain what everything is made out of. So now I have trying to say that, that everything is made out of this. But what holds them together? Why do these protons and uh, protons is formed? 
Okay, why the nucleus form? Who is bringing those quarks together? That's where the force comes. <coughs> we have the total four forces, as we know, strong, weak, electromagnetic, and gravitation. I'll keep leave apart gravitation at the moment, but uh, talk about the three other forces. The, 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 for example, this is the photon, which is the quanta of the electromagnetic force. Okay, and this is the gluon, which is the carrier of the strong force, which is responsible for these quarks to come together to form the proton and neutron. And then finally, this W and Z, that is the carrier of an another force, weak force, that again Rajaji was talking about, Enrico Fermi was first given that idea of such a force, that which is responsible for the spontaneous decay of many elements, right? Uranium decay away and so on, their spontaneous decay, radioactivity, and that's responsible for these weak forces. So now each of these forces can be also, there is a carrier of that force, okay? Each of the force, there is a carrier. What I have listed here are those carriers. For example, the photon is the carrier of the electromagnetic force. So this is the matter field, that here is the definition, that matter, matter field are those things, so they, they exchange this force particle, and while exchanging that force particle, that's why they come together, okay? So when two electrons comes together and repel, because they exchange photons, okay? When the electron goes around the nucleus, okay, to form the atom, that is because they exchange photon, because the nucleus has uh, uh, the protons, and then you have the electron. So this is the idea we have, of course, and then I'm not, I'm not going to give you a particle physics talk, we need the Higgs to give masses to these particles. So that completes our idea of the particle physics or the standard model, what you call. Okay, very good. So this is the idea we have. So now, with that idea, let me just give you one transparency how we explore these ideas. So this is, I'll bring you the talk about what is the tools that we need? What is the instrument? Because we are going in smaller and smaller things. Usually you don't need a telescope, but you need a microscope to see small things, right? You need a microscope to see, see small things. So what is the microscope that we use here? So that microscope, let me say, I'll, not, I'll give you later about the microscope, but let's say I, what kind of resolution of the microscope I need. I need to see the atom, a resolution of 10 to the power minus 10 meter. So if you have a microscope of 10 to the power minus 10 meter and look at things, you will see that in this form. Okay, you will see the atom and the electron, that structure, that we'll be able to see. If you increase the, so in that idea, your nucleus will be just like a point. But now if you increase the resolution of your microscope by another four orders of magnitude, okay, 10,000 times better resolution of your microscope, and focus on this nucleus, then the nucleus will not be any more a tiny particle point. It will, you will see a structure in that point. And the structure is just a compact object of those proton and neutron together. You will see that structure. If you go on increasing the power of your microscope by another order of magnitude, say 10 to the power minus 15 meter, then you will start seeing inside these protons or neutrons the quarks, okay? The, that there are three quarks inside them. You will be able to see that. In fact, really speaking, we know that even the structure is much, much, much complicated than just three quarks. There are always inside them a virtual quark, anti-quarks, and gluons are all moving around, created, destroyed. So it's a very complicated structure. But even with that, experimentalists will not stop there. They will start want to ask the question, what is quark made out of? Okay? So you increase your resolution and look inside the quark, what is made out of? And we have been able so what, take one of the quarks and start looking what is inside that. So increase your resolution of your microscope. And we have so far gone up to something like 10 to the power minus 18 meter, okay? So 10 to the power minus 18 meter, and till now, we have not seen anything inside quark. So as an experimentalist, I will say that, okay, currently there is no evidence of any further structure inside quark. So that's why the quark is our, for us, a fundamental particle, okay? I will not say what is happening in the future. Well, these are the four forces that I have already discussed with you. We have the gravity force, which is 
keeping apart because we still do not know how to handle that uh, in the same way we handle the other three forces. That means explaining them by their carrier and so on. And we have clear ideas, but there are still mathematical issues that have to be solved. But these three forces, weak forces, these are the carriers. Uh, the photons is a carrier of electromagnetic forces, and strong force is carried by gluon. Okay? So these are the forces. Now, so now another just transparency. Why you all want to know this? What is the understanding when you are looking inside a tiny object like a nucleus or inside a quark? Why you want to study their properties? Because this is actually fundamentally linked to the whole evolution of our universe, at least the early part of our universe. At the very early part of the universe, the universe was not like that. They are really a soup of those fundamental particles. They're very dense, very high, so only those fundamental particles are there. So by studying those fundamental particles and their properties in the accelerator today, we will be able to you know, understand what was happening at the very early part of our universe, because that has happened already. And we can't, we are not, it is not in our hands to create another universe and study that. So we have to study that from other fields. So particle physicists help understand the early part of this universe. That is another reason why you want to go there. Well, that's okay. So now, the, my main topic of my talk is how do you do know? How do you know all these things? What are the tools that we use for understanding that? How do I have learned that? In fact, I'll start with 1911, the tools that we have used. And only thing I'll tell you, that we have never changed that tools. We use the same tools, only we have increased the sophistication of that tool. So what are these tools? Rutherford used to break the atom and to find the structure. That you know all, I mean, this is a textbook uh, object of uh, probably in that um, class 10 or 11 or 12. You have studied that Rutherford experiment, what he did, right? So let me just repeat that one for you. So he has a source of energetic particle. You want to something, so if you want to know inside that, you basically break that. How will break that? You throw stone into that one. And probably, probably some stone will go inside and will tell us what is inside that. So exactly that. So he need an energetic source of particle. And in 1911, only energetic source of particles that he had was the alpha particle that is radioactive. Okay? Some radioactive sources, it emits alpha particles with some energy. And those alpha particles coming out, and they use that particle to heat a gold foil. Okay? And then look into the scattering of those particles from this gold foil. Right? And from there, so what you need, an energetic beam of particles, a target, that is the gold foil, and then the particles will get scattered. So you want to have a detector to detect them, which direction they are going. Are you going straight or going in a different direction? Okay? That time he has only a fluorescent screen where these alpha particles will go and create a spot of light. And then his student will be asked to go on shift and just put their eyes, and he said, okay, this is 30 degree, it is scattered, this is 20 degree, this is 50 degree, this is 80 degree, and so on. So his students were there, and uh, so they will count that. Two of his students, this is that experiment. Well, so these are the need of the detectors. Okay? And from that, a simple experiment, we got the structure of the atom. Simple experiment that we got the structure of the atom. So now, let me talk about, when you are talking about detectors, so this is actually now the picture of a cosmic ray that we have heard about cosmic ray. Cosmic rays also give us energetic particles. And in the early part of the last century, especially in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, most of the particle physics experiments were done using energetic cosmic ray particles. After that, only accelerator took over, really speaking. So there, they used to study the particle by capturing picture like that. So this is actually a cosmic ray particles has come and created a new particles. Okay? And we have taken the picture. Now the question you will ask, that how do you take this picture? I mean, I mean, here I am telling you that millions of particles, billions of particles are going through you all the time. But how do I prove to you? I mean, I can just make a statement. I have to prove that that particles are really going through it. That means I have to take a picture of those particles going. And that's what we have to develop the tool. But these are the pictures of the particles. So let's see how we do the particles. Now about, the, about detector, 
Now, similarly about particle accelerator, a few things. So, what is a particle accelerator? So, I told you the experiment that Rutherford did, he has an energetic particle and he hit that particle to a gold foil, right? And then look into the scattering. So, he has a particle and a target. So, you need. So, how do you create new particles? When a energetic particle comes, hits a target and then it will from there some energy will get converted into new particles and those new particles will start help of them. Of course, in this case, not all the energy of that incoming particle get converted into new particles mass, because there are energy and mass and conservation law has to be followed and only it goes like something like square root of that energy is available. Okay? However, if we do an experiment like this, where you are hitting two particles together, then the enormous energy that is there, if they are fundamental particles, the whole energy can be used to create new particles. Okay? It's become a much more violent collision. It is like, think of that. I am not going to tell you the experiment. So, for example, if you are driving a car and you hit a wall, don't do that. Huh? Just imagine how much is the damage. But imagine now two colliding cars. Okay? The, the collision will be much more violent. So, when colliding two particles like this, then you will get, you'll get the whole energy will be available to you to create new particles. So, the, there is the advantage of that, but there are certain disadvantages also that, because it is very difficult to, to have a large number of such particles and uh, together uh, uh, compared to this experiment. So, there are advantage, disadvantage and so on. But anyway, so this is how we collide and create new particles. Now, in the real accelerator, how do you do that? How do you collide particles? So, what we have in the, in, this, in the accelerator, you basically first you have a particle. It does not have too much energy. You have to energize the particle. If I have a football, how do you increase its speed? How do you increase the speed of a football? What you will do? Kick it hard. Kick it hard. Exactly that we do here. So, here is an accelerator and the the, it is like a race course where the particles are running and these green objects are called magnets. These magnets are there basically to keep them on the track, otherwise the particle will go straight. But if you put in a magnet, they will go on rotating. Okay? But in somewhere in that race course, there is one object where you can kick those particles and this is called RF cavity. This RF cavity's job, whenever it comes here, it gives a heat and this energy increases okay? and so on. So, it goes on, it increase, increase, increase the energy. When the increase the energy is maximum, then you allow them to collide each other because the particle goes this way and then you create new particles. Okay. So, now this is another example I will give you that when you colliding, what you are doing? A electron is colliding with a positron or a proton is colliding with antiproton. But what you are getting out of that? You are getting out new particles, pi meson, k meson, Higgs boson, tau, uh, the top quark and so on. So, it is like to me that you are hitting two strawberries head on and from the collision point you are getting all those beautiful fruits, apples and bananas and so on. Okay? It is like magic, but it happens exactly that, right? Because this is happened because of the magic formula given to us that you can convert energy into masses. And that's what is happening in this collision here. Okay? So, this is how we are creating new particles. Of course, the race course is little become bigger. And uh, now, you know, it started with the smaller, smaller, and now finally, ultimately today, the biggest this particle accelerator, which is a 26 kilometer ring. 26 kilometer ring at CERN, which is called the LHC, and where the which is the biggest accelerator so far, where proton and antiprotons are colliding and creating new particle, probably Professor Godbole is here, she will be talking more about that and what is happening there. So, but what we do there in that, in that accelerator, the protons and antiprotons are colliding and at some point when they are collision point, we combine, we, we put their particle detector, which will detect all those new particles that is created. Okay. So, now what you get there is from that experiment, this is probably you have seen this kind of pictures trashed in the even TV screen when the Higgs boson was discovered that you have seen the track. What is happening here? 
the protons is coming from here, antiprotons are going, colliding, and what you are seeing these are the tracks of the new particles. Okay? These are the particle which is created at that point where a proton and antiproton is coming and colliding. Now this is a picture. Again the question comes, how do you get that picture? What is that particle picture, how do you get which kind of camera you have used? So that brings you this question, how do you look for particles, fundamental particles? So now there are problems, right? So now if I ask you the question that in this road, you are Sherlock Holmes, and I have the, there is a crime has happened, and I'm asking the question that uh, you know the, the the people who have done the crime has uh, run away with the car um, on this road. So you have gone there and looking for evidence, what kind of car it is or something. So first of all, I mean, do you find anything? I mean, if I say that uh, what car has gone on this road five minutes back, nothing, just the road. But this may not be a proper road. If I make you a proper road you will get the signature, you will get the evidence. So let me show you my road. Here it is. Now can you see it? So now, see that is not the real road actually. So if you have to go to a crime scene, you have to make a road like this. And probably you look at the tire mark and it will tell you that not only it, that a car has gone five minutes back or some ten minutes back, you will also know from the mark what kind of car it is probably. Okay? So these details you will be able to find out provided you make the medium proper. So when I'm telling you that, you know, the millions of particles are going through your body, but you are not seeing them simply because we are not really making the medium to be visible for particles uh, while going through that. So now how we'll make that one? So detecting particles. As you know, elementary particles are extremely small in size and may not have any size. Okay? And they go speed in, they go approaching our speed of light. Unlike normal matter all around us, we do not see these particles in our eyes. How do we know these particles exist, first of all? And although invisible to our eyes, they leave behind their footprints in the medium they pass through. Like that happens to the car. Like right? when the car has gone, tire mark is left behind. And we can see that one. Okay? So definitely all the particles is going through the medium. They are leaving their footprints in the medium. Only thing we have to detect those footprints. And what are those footprints? The footprint that is, these particles, many of them are charged. Electron, proton, okay, pi meson. Most of them are charged particles. A charged particle, when it goes through any medium, what it does? It ionizes the medium. Because it is a charge, it will, it will also interact with the electrons of the atoms of the medium and then because it has energy, it will pass on some energy of that one, and that energy will be enough to kick out those electrons from those orbit of that atom. So these atoms will get ionized. So this is one method. Even if they do not get ionized, they may go to an excited state, and then return to the ground state again after some time through the emission of light. So when the particle is going through the medium, it may be ionizing the medium, or it is emitting light. We have to have detectors to detect those ionization or light. That's all we do. Okay? That is all we do. And then you will get all the picture, all the beautiful picture, all the physics that we derive from there. Okay. Now, so now let me talk about some early detectors when it all started, particle physics. You know, one of them is cloud chamber. This cloud chamber was a classic example. It was invented almost more than a century back by C.T.R. Wilson in 1911. And he received Nobel Prize in 1931. He received Nobel Prize for not any physics. He received Nobel Prize for inventing this beautiful apparatus, which enabled other scientists to discover many new particles. Okay? But he got his Nobel Prize only for invention of the tools. So that's what I'm, you are engineers, so I'm giving you the thing, that even for developing tools that will help science, people can get their recognition. So this is a cloud chamber, I'll come to that. Then photographic plates. Photographic plates that I showed that picture of cosmic rays, right? A cosmic ray particles and getting disintegrated into many particles. And you take a picture of that one. These are called emulsion plates. And it was extensively used by physicists in India as well as abroad. Okay? And then in 1948, Cecil Powell, he discovered 
the pi mesons, one of the particles that I have shown you there, okay? And he and got his Nobel Prize in 1950 for discovering pi using this emulsion technique. But the reason he received that prize is basically a good resolution photographic emulsion plate was made available to him just after the Second World War. So this was this was really great achievement. Bubble chamber. Soon you will see. Bubble chamber was invented by Donald Glaser in the 50s, and he got received Nobel Prize in 1960 again for inventing the detector. Okay. Spark chamber. These are some of the earlier detectors that we have used. Used by Lederman and, and his company. Some these are the these are the three physicists who got Nobel Prize using that spark chamber when he found that there are a muon neutrino. As I told you, that there are each of those lepton, electron, muon, and tau meson, has each of them one neutrino. One is electron neutrino associated with electron, and muon neutrino associated with muon. And he, using this spark chamber, did an experiment which proved that the muon neutrinos are different than the electron neutrinos, though both of them are neutrinos, but they are different kinds. So this is actually some of the early detectors that we have. And then let me just go a little bit about cloud chamber operation, how it operates. A cloud chamber is that, you know, what happens is that how the cloud is formed. Okay, if there is suddenly there is a low pressure region which is created where there is for continuous formation of the small nuclides of cloud, cloud, and then they will become bigger, seed of clouds, and they will become bigger. Okay? So there, same thing happens here. So what happens here, this is actually, this is not the cloud chamber, huh? this is this cloud chamber. And this is actually a super saturated, a super saturated gas, okay? A super saturated gas is there, and if you reduce its pressure, and then a particle is going, along it, when the particle is going, the ionization is formed, and those ions become nuclides for the formation of cloud. And the particle is going, along with that, those ionization created ions, and then we will be forming small, small clouds. And then you take a picture of that one. And that's the picture that you see here, OK? This is the picture that you see here. This is the cloud formation along the particle track. And this is the famous track of the positron that was first taken. And that's what they discovered, that there is a particle called positron, which is just like electron, but opposite to its charge, and as required by Dirac's theory. So this is actually very famous experiment that became and because of the cloud chamber. Now, this is actually another cloud chamber picture, OK? But what is there? And it's like a flower bus, but it's not. What you have here, this is a cloud chamber, and below that is just a radioactive source, which is emitting alpha particles, OK? And alpha particles, each of them are going through and creating cloud along them. And they are, they are here. But one thing you have realized that one, all these alpha particles almost stop after a certain distance, and exactly the same distance almost. Because alpha particle comes out with fixed energy, same energy always from a source. And that's why they will only travel the same distance. And this is this actually is proving that also. Okay? There are many things, so you can even the simple picture you can interpret and get information about it. Okay? Now this is a cloud chamber picture of an electron in a magnetic field, OK? Now, in a magnetic field, a charged particle, as I, I think earlier speaker also told you, that it rotates, right? It bends in a magnetic field because of the Lorentz forces. A charged particle, char for example, a current carrying wire, is also exist experience a force in a magnetic field. Same way, in, if you have an electron which is going, and if you, in a magnetic field, it will start curvature and then it will start rotating in a helical structure, and it will be stopped here. So this is a picture of a 16.9 MeV energy electron, and, and then it goes and stops. And so this is the picture you can see. See what has happened? These are cloud chamber. When the particle is there, it just ionizes along its path and creating the clouds along that, in, that, in the vapor, OK? Supersaturated vapor. OK. These are emulsion pictures, those photographic pictures. They are just like photography. You know, old days you have done photography there, you know? Same technique, you expose, the particle goes through that one, and it will create those tracks here, OK? Cosmic green tracks. And then, now the tracks, from the tracks itself, you can know which kind of particle. For example, whether it is a hydrogen nucleus or an iron nucleus, 
depending upon a hydrogen nucleus, has only one positive charge, right? If you go to helium, it has two positive charge. And iron, similarly, much more, 26. So you see, because of the charge, the amount of ionization it creates is large. So these tracks are becoming thicker and thicker and thicker. So looking at the track, you will not all be able to that a particle has gone through. What is that particle? OK? You can also find out from that properties of that one. OK. So now coming to the bubble chamber. Bubble chamber, instead of a supersaturated gas that we use in a cloud chamber, it is basically a superheated liquid. OK? I will give you that. You know superheated liquid? You have seen superheated liquid. Probably not seen, but your mother used in the kitchen every day. A pressure cooker. A pressure cooker is where you have very high pressure, and that is superheated liquid. Okay? You don't do that. But if you suddenly open the lid or open the uh, pressure cooker, you will see that immediately, spontaneously, it started bubbling. Okay? So same thing we do in bubble chamber. You have a super, you have a high pressure, you have kept the fluid, and the particle is going, it has ionized it, produced a heat, I mean, generated heat at the, along its path because it is a deposited energy, and suddenly if you open, those points, ionization point, becomes the place where it starts bubbling. But you don't allow that bubble to go too much, because then what will happen? Because you'll, everything will get lost. You don't know when the bubble started. So just when the bubble is just forming, at that time you take a picture of that one. Okay? And then you'll get, here is a picture you can see, in that he has done using cosmic rays. But later on, we have beautiful picture of those of those tracks that we see using a bubble chamber. And that came later, after the cloud chamber era is over. This is in the 60s, those pictures were taken. Okay? So you know, over the time, you, I told you that 100 years from Rutherford, we are using the same technique, but we are only developing, making it more sophisticated. Ideas are same. You have to take picture of those particles. So here you can see these are the, some of the beautiful pictures that we have seen, and from many other particles have been. You know, you have, you have discovered from there. This is the spark chamber. I told you the earlier spark chamber. This is the picture of the experiment that was done in Brookhaven National Lab in the United States in 1962. What is a spark chamber? A spark chamber is just two, think of that two plates, okay? It's a conducting plate, two conducting plates, and between them you have kept a very high voltage, okay? And whenever a charged particle is going, Again, I told you that will ionize. And once between two high, you have kept two electrodes in a very high field, okay? And then when, whenever there is a particle is going, that will become a sparking point, okay? And it will spark around these two points because that is a ionization created. So that has reduced the radio, is resistance of the gas between these two electrons very much. So you can have a sparking point. Now, particles are all the way going. So along the path, it just goes on sparking. And you have a camera. You take a picture, and you get those beautiful pictures here. Okay, these are the pictures. So these are the spark chamber, like those electrodes are here, and then you can see the particles are going, and they are giving those beautiful pictures. Okay, and again, this was, as I told you, was used by Lederman and his group to discover the muon neutrino. So each of them, you know, detector. You invent a new detector, and you because you want to find new particles. So you cannot continue using the same detector if you want to go for newer, newer particles and newer, so on, because you have to improve upon that. So these are some of the early ones. The modern particle detector was started really around that time when the bubble chamber era was coming to an end. Because bubble chamber, cloud chamber, these are all slow devices, you know? Because you, you have seen that you have to have a, uh, you have to make it that pump has to be reduced and uh, so on. So those, those are mechanical devices, though they will take its own time. So now if you want to detect, in an accelerator where many particles are created all the time, then you cannot use those slow devices. So then this came in 1968. This was by George Charpak. This really started the new revolution in particle detectors when he built what you call the multi-wire proportional cha chamber. Proportional chamber was there for a long time. It is Geiger counters, okay? Used in the early days also, many of them. Uh, but this actually new idea where he put these wires, anode wires, a large number of them, very close to each other, maybe a few centimeters separated, each of them. And then whenever, and then you have a, uh, you have a cathode plane on the top, and make and a big area, 
you know, meter by meter or whatever it is. You can make quite big lab graph. And you put these anode wire, and they are all kept anode wire at a high voltage, positive voltage. And then a particle is going through that. When it's going through that, it ionizes the gas inside again, and electron ion pairs are created. And those electrons will be attracted towards this anode wire, depending upon how it is created. And once we go closer to the anode wire, the field becomes so much that one electron will create, the electron get energized and it will create more ions. And those will create more electrons and they will create more ions. So there is a kind of avalanche process took place from where few electrons will get multiplied by a factor of 1,000 or you know, 10,000 and so on. So then there is a suddenly a big pulse will be deposited in that oil. So now you put many, many such layers of proportional uh, chamber and then you'll see the beautiful tracks like this. Okay, because you connect the pulses in a computer, and then you can be able to see that one. Okay, this is actually one of the picture, and uh, that is a collision and taking place in LHC in a lead-lead collision, not proton-antiproton. And there are thousands of particles, and each of them, this you know, this is the detector which all these wires there, but they have been able to detect each of those tracks. Imagine that now, why we have taken this sophistication. It is not that always you have to use that kind of particle detector. You can use simple liquid particle detector. This is a liquid argon chamber, okay? A liquid argon, a tank of liquid argon, which is becoming very important in the current time. And it will be much, much bigger liquid argon container is being used for particle detector. I won't tell you how big it is. Actually, each of them is 17 kiloton that is coming up in Fermilab, which will be used. But what they are doing in that argon a, a neutrino is coming in this case. An earlier speaker has talked about neutrinos. You cannot detect neutrinos directly because it's a neutral particle. They will not ionize. But once the neutrino comes, interact, and it will produce many charged particles. And this is so that a neutrino has come here, and these charged particles are created. But once you created those charged particles, they create ionization, and you can detect that ionization. This is actually a small prototype of the liquid argon chamber. It is called TPC, time projection chamber, and where you can detect those tracks again, OK? Now, coming back to this, this I will give you the one transparency of what the INO experiment is going to use. This is also a particle detector. I know somebody explained to an earlier speaker that it is a resistive plate chamber. A resistive plate chamber is nothing but, you know, it's a two glass plates. Each of them is two millimeter thick and coated with a graphite coating on the outer size of those glass plates because I want to apply the high voltage. That's why I have to coat this graphite because, you know, this uh, glass is non-conducting. You, you will not be able to apply some voltage. So you just coat a graphite and apply the high voltage, 10 kilovolt. And then on the top of them, those are pickup strips, okay? You know, you are probably now engineering student. You learn that one quickly. So, this is actually when the very charged particles is going through that one, it will creating those electron ion pair, and the electrons will start moving toward the positive charge, whatever is the plate is, one is negative, one is positive, so toward the positive charge, and while going toward the positive charge, it will get multiplied, and a large number of electrons will be created further. And that will create a current which will be picked up by, by these by this copper strip, wherever it is. If it is particle is going here, this one. If it is going here, then this one, and so on. So you get the position information from the pulses, whichever pickup strip is fired, OK? And similarly, if you keep one strip here and other strips in the orthogonal direction, then you will can know one of them is fired, one of them will be fired, and you can correlating them, you will know the position the particle has gone through, OK? So that's the idea. And for example, here, Professor Tanan has kept you a simple picture. This is the glass plate. It is not yet coated with graphite, but this is a glass plate. We apply gas inside, and then this pickup strip, actually here is a, now this is the glass plate. Here is, now these glass plates are coated with graphite on either side. So this is your drag screen. And then you put this pickup strip, just put on top here, and put one on the bottom in the opposite direction. And then you apply high voltage, put it there, Whenever a charged particle will go, one of these copper strips will fire here, and one of the copper strips will fire here. And that's it. And you put many of them, stack them together, particle is going. So along with that, you'll get space point. You connect in your computer, you get the particle tracks. That's it you have to do. Okay. So this is the RPCs that is used. And 
you are not using this, you know, each of them is two meter by two meter, and there will be 30,000 of them. The whole thing has been developed in the lab, and now as I, as speaker, earlier speaker also told you, it has been given to the industry, and Sangobian in Chennai, they are making in large number. Okay, so there is industrial application of that. I'll give you one transparency, I have not too much time, so I'll now talk about light. So as I told you, there are two ways the particles interact. One, they ionize, or they can excite. Once they excite, then it will go to the electron, it will go to the higher state and come back and it will give you light. And if that medium is transparent to that light, it has to be, okay, so that condition has to be satisfied. Then the light will come out of the medium and then you can say, for example, your crystal like this, where inside that the particle is produced, it produces light and the light comes out here and in the edge you put a photo detector, a detector that can detect light. For example, he has kept here one. Here is an example of a photo detector. It's a photomultiplier tube. So you put this scintillator here and then connect it to that one. Then the light comes and light get converted into electrons and the electrons get multiplied inside that photomultiplier. That's why it's called photomultiplier. It multiplies the electrons and ultimately you'll get a pulse here. And then you make again large number of them and then you can detect them. So this scintillator is what it is. Light is shown here, for example. If you see here, here is an example. I have built it many years back. So this is an example. This is a scintillator. The light comes all around. It comes to the edge. The light gets collected into this wavelength shifting fiber. They collect the light, and then total transmission through comes here, and then comes here. Then I put my photomultiplier to this one. Connect. Then you will get the light when a particle goes through that one. So like that, you can make many forms. This is another form. This is a stack of scintillators, one fiber each. Now, depending upon where the particle goes, it will give a pulse to this fiber, and you can connect either a photomultiplier, and nowadays you have even better techniques, like silicon photomultiplier, it's a small silicon device which will collect light. So all these different kinds of detectors, you can build them, and you can use them. Now, let me now just go to the, sorry. Okay, let me now just, so a, a particle detector, modern particle detectors, what we use at CERN, okay, or at Fermilab and accelerator center and so on, is not just one detector. It has many layers, like onion screen. And whenever the particle is produced, there are many different kinds of particles produced. Electrons, pions, you know, K-mesons, or neutrinos, muons, and so on. Each detect, you have to detect each of them. Not one detector has the ability to detect all of them, or they detect, but identifying all of them. So you make a composite detector of various layers surrounding the collision point, so that you can identify all the particles that is created in such an collision. So for example, here is a silicon detector, okay, which, is, which will go there. Now, so for, a, for just a little, you know, this is not connected to the accelerator experiment, just to give you an idea that even water can be a source of your light, your detector. You can have a big water tank, and that is your particle detector. Here is one such particle, a water tank, little bigger. It is something like 60 meter in height and 70 meter in, in radius, okay? Kept underground, about one kilometer below rock. And this, see, this, this is actually can, can give you some idea. These are a few people going in a boat. And these are the photomultiplier tubes all around that water tank, like those photomultiplier tubes I have here, but much bigger. Now, this actually, the light, whenever a neutrino comes, it will convert into an electron, and this electron will produce light, called Cherenkov light. And the light will get detected by this photomultiplier, okay? And you can get detected. Now, you can also make very big, some, for some particle like neutrinos, you need detector of a kilometer size. A kilometer size detector, a kilometer in, uh, in all directions, kilometer cube detector. And that detector you cannot make here. So you have to go somewhere where you can make those detectors. For example, in the so if you have this water Cherenkov detector, then you can use the sea bed itself, the bottom of the sea, okay, as a detector medium. And you put those photomultiplier anchored to the anchor to the bottom of the sea. Okay? There is a string of photomultiplier and connected to a buoy and so on, so that it will keep it float. And then put them and goes on putting them in a kilometer square area. Okay? Of each of the string is a kilometer long. I mean imagine. And then when a neutrino comes here, they'll interact, produce this light, and this light will be detected by this photomultiplier. 
these are special detectors. There are such big detectors is required where you have very high energy cost neutrinos are coming and their number is extremely small. So they are, because their number is small, you make it much bigger so that you can catch some of them. So, you know, today we need this kind of detector and this kind of detector is being developed and one of them is already there in the, in the South Pole under ice and one of them is coming up in the Mediterranean, below the Mediterranean Sea. So this, so you can have a small tiny detector like this, you can have a kilometer type of detector depending upon what physics you want to do. Now, by finally, so what you do, the particle come, they interact in this detector, create a new particle, okay, and I have to track each of them, measure their momentum. Once I have done that, I have measured their mass of the particle, and then I have, so I'll, I'll just keep those, these composite detectors, where I have, as I told you, the point is covered by various layers of detector. Each of them has a specific purpose to do, and so on. Now, at the finally what you have, whenever now you have a detecting particle collision, protons come, antiprotons come, they collide, and then new particles are created. The new particles get detected in this detector. Now you remove the detector, and in the computer, you just get those pictures, okay? And that completes your idea, and from there, you start looking for new particles and so on, and that's how Higgs is discovered. Well, that's not, let me just stop you, and then finally, my one transparency of the INO experiment that also explained to you earlier, it will be actually a 150 layer of those iron plates and sandwiched between those two meter by two meter are pieces just I just showed you. But not this one feet by one feet, they will be each of them one meter by one meter. You put them, put the iron plate, and these are the coils coming up. This coil, because this iron plate has to be magnetized, so these coils will be used for magnetizing that, and ultimately when you make the detector, it will be a detector of this size, each one of them something like 16 meter by 16 meter and 14 meter high, and complete object, and three of them will be locating for detecting the atmospheric detect uh, experiment that way. Anyway, I'll be talking tomorrow, specifically only on neutrinos, so that's a completely different talk, but today I wanted to give you a glimpse of how a particle physicist detects particles, so on. So that's my end of the talk. Thank you.